dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a stand-up comedy legend from the sec from the first for the first wave of post-Vietnam uh, stand-up comedy, and I am talking about Denny Johnston. He came up in that era with David Letterman, Jay Leno, Tom Dreesen, Gallagher, Billy Braver, um, the Unknown Comic, so many great comics in that era in the early days of the Comedy Store. And I'm having him on the show today to talk about all that stuff. Uh, he's a hilarious impressionist. He does a dead-on John Wayne. Does it better than Rich Little does, I have to say. I love his John Wayne impression. Um, he was on Red Fox's Dirty Dirty Jokes. He was on the HBO Young Comedian Special with Chevy Chase hosting. And I'm going to ask him about all that stuff. Um, I interviewed Gloria Vassi last summer, and she said that um, Denny would be a great interview. So I'm going to find out. Also, I'd like to say rest in peace to uh, Brian Dennehy, one of the greatest character actors that ever lived, from Cocoon to Tommy Boy to Ten to Foul Play to FX, Legal Eagles, the list goes on. He made so many great movies. Rest in peace, Brian. Happy uh, birthday to the late, great Charlie Chaplin. And uh, Peter Mark Richmond, who is still alive, I tried to get him on the podcast, but uh, he's having some health issues, um, according to his daughter. But happy birthday, nevertheless, Peter, and God bless you on this day. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Denny Johnston. Comedy Central. <laughs> That's a good one, Denny. <laughs> What's up? Oh, nothing much. Uh, everything okay now? Oh, you don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's weird. Now I'm going through a. We got to put our dog down tomorrow. So. Oh, I know how that is. Yeah, everyone's going through it. You know, uh, we've had her almost twelve years, and she's been a, just a wonderful dog. But uh, she's got you know lung cancer, and we. We're just trying to keep her comfortable, but it's getting worse every night. You know, she has trouble sleeping and stuff. Oh, so, so sorry. Yeah, we all, but we all sign up for that when we get pets, you know? Yeah, we do. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Sure. Uh, are you are you on now? Or Yeah. I, 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 I always record my intro long before the call because I don't want to... I don't want to waste anyone's time with it. Oh, well, yeah, well, uh, it's, um, yeah, what happened, the reason I was gone and I wasn't able to do it earlier was uh, our tax preparer, uh, he's gotten very expensive. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, uh, like every year, what I do, he has a ranch up in uh, Gardner Valley, that's above Palm Springs. Right. And then he has a ranch down here, and his wife uh, has. They have five horses, so every twice a year, he's got to move the horses, the parrot, the five cats, the uh, all these animals, and tra- a couple of tractors and everything up up to that ranch. It's just crazy, and and then he always asks me to ride, take his motorcycle up. And uh, I just rode his brand new $29,000 motorcycle up. Can you believe it? Wow. A Honda, a yeah. Honda uh, Gold, Goldwing, it's called. Yeah. That's I, Honda's, you know, big uh, road cruiser. And they used to be ugly as sin, but now they're really pretty. I mean, mm-hmm. he's looking streamlined, yeah. that old boxy looking. So anyway, so talk to me about what comedy, huh? Yeah. So going back in time, uh, did you gravitate toward comedy early on in your childhood? Well, I was always the class clown. I mean, I always made my classmates laugh, and then I got bad grades, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I would do it. I, it, it was fun to make strangers laugh, and they, those, those weren't strangers, but I've always, I like, you know, I 
if I if I could say something funny in a movie theater, you know, mm -hmm. and makes the whole place laugh, I'll do it. I'll yell it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just can't say bomb anymore. <laughs> one time, one time, you know, remember John Fox? Oh, oh yeah, John Fox. Yeah, John Fox and I were working the punchline in San Francisco, and uh, mm -hmm. we we. Uh, you know, during the week, the weekend came. Saturday, Fox calls me in my hotel room, and he goes, "Hey, let's go see a movie." I said, "Well, what's playing?" He goes, "Ah, there's a Al Pacino movie." Uh, and you know, so we decided to go because we both like Al Pacino. Yeah. And uh, the movie was called Cruising. Cruising. Yeah. And Pacino played an undercover cop who was to find out who's been murdering these uh, these bikers, you know, with the chains and everything. Mm -hmm. But they were gay guys, gay bikers, and there was these murders happening, so he went undercover as, as a gay biker. So this is a real movie. Yeah, I remember the movie. Okay, so John Fox and I go to this movie, and in the lobby, when we were getting our candy and popcorn and shit, we noticed that there was there weren't any females in this movie theater. No, it's just all males. But this was San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. So we decided just to hang out in the lobby for a while and then go in when the movie started, right? So right. we're walking down, and they've got this disclaimer on, and it says uh, something about you know, although this motion picture uh, depicts the gay lifestyle and blah, 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 you know, mm -hmm. it does not reflect on the gay community as a whole. And I said, look, John, they spelled whole wrong. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, that place will exploded with laughter. <laughs> I can imagine. The thing that was weird was that everyone was just finished reading that, you know? And so when they read W-H-O-L-E and I said, they spelled whole wrong, man, that got a big laugh. That's probably one of the biggest laughs I've gotten in my uh, life. <laughs> Did you watch the Ed Sullivan show and Jack Parr and Steve Allen growing up? Uh-uh, no. Oh, sure I did. I mean... Yeah, Jack Parr and uh, Steve Allen. Schmack, schmack. He used to, <laughs> didn't he say that? I think he did. Oh, yeah, he, he'd do that. Schmack, schmack. And, uh, yeah, Louie Nye and Don, Don Knotts, the men on the street. Tom Poston, Bill Dana. Huh? And Bill Dana? Bill Dana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, Jose Menes. Yeah. Um, my, my favorite was Jonathan Winters, though. Yeah, one of the best. My brother and I got that got that album. It was a thirty three speed album, you know, big one. And we brought that thing. In. It was called the Wacky World of Jonathan Winters, I think. Mm -hmm. And my brother and I played that thing till the, it wouldn't play anymore. I mean, we laughed every every time. We'd laugh just as hard at every bit, you know. Yeah. He was a genius, that guy. I remember he was on the Dean Martin roast for Frank Sinatra, and just he made up this whole character on the spot, uh, this guy who drove the bus for Frank, and just everything he said was just on fire. I mean, that guy had a real gift. Oh, yeah. Yeah, genius. And did you see the, uh, the Carson show that uh, Jonathan was on and Robin Williams? Yes. Robin Robin comes out and does about 20 minutes of killer stuff, and then Jonathan comes out in that cavalry uniform. Mm -hmm. It's classic. So where are you originally from? I was born in New York, but raised in L.A. I actually was in New York till I was only three, about three and a half months old, and then I came out with my mom and dad to California. And my dad did him. He was a singer, and mm -hmm. he uh, he did a movie with Catherine Grayson. Oh yeah, who was a big MGM star. And they fell in love. And my dad uh, 
said, I want to, I want to be with you. So Catherine made him take her to my mom face to face. Mm -hmm. Catherine said, Johnny wants to date me. How do you feel about that? <laughs> my mom said, take him. You can have him. And my mom always liked Catherine Grayson for having the, <laughs> you know, the class to, to, do, to make Johnny, my dad, do that, you know. Yeah, that's pretty, but, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, and the, the reason I got into comedy was because I... I don't know. I I was painting houses. I was like writing songs and uh, painting houses to stay afloat. And I bought. I had just painted Kenny Rogers' house. Oh. Uh huh. This just, before Kenny was had the first edition, you know. And we just lost him. Yeah. It was Kenny Rogers, and and I just had finished painting his house, and I hocked my spray machine because I couldn't pay my gas bill or electric or something and I walked out in front of the hawk shop and I thought to myself I've got to do something so I uh, wrote myself a comedy act and did it at the uh, Troubadour on Hoot Night about I don't know a month later and I got an encore my very first time on stage as a comic and uh, and then Gary Muldeer mm -hmm. told me, yeah, he called me because Gary and I were in a folk group together called the Back Porch Majority, which was uh, Randy Sparks' group. Randy had the Christie Minstrels, and then he sold the Christies, and he started a group called Back Porch Majority. And then Gary Muldeer and I were in that group, and uh, Gary called me one day and said, hey, there's a new comedy club on Sunset called the Comedy Store. Check it out. So that was in uh, 1972. Mm -hmm. it, it was that how you uh, met uh, Ken Vassy? No, I knew Ken before. Yeah, I knew Ken from the, I don't know if you know that the, uh, that Mitzi started a club over in Westwood called the Comedy Store West. Right. Yeah. The Westwood Comedy Store. And that building used to be Leadbetters. And Leadbetters is where I met Gary Mulder and Steve Martin and Ken Bassey, all those people. John Denver played there. John Denver, yeah, John Denver. Um, the Birds. There's Carpenters came and Michael Nesmith, and, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. The who's who of that scene. Yeah. It was fun. I mean, just really talented people, you know, just, I really uh, kind of grew up being around talented, you know, Steve Martin was 20 years old when I met him. I'm, I'm 20. He's, tw he's, uh, he was born in, in, uh, August. I was born in November. He's only a few months older than, uh, younger than, older than I am. Yeah. So when you got to the comedy store in 72, uh, who was there? Hardly anyone. <laughs> um, uh, Sammy Shore. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a group called The Graduates, which was uh, Jim Stahl. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, Jim Stahl and um, Craig T. Nelson. Craig T. Nelson. And Barry Levinson, famous director. You know, um, mm -hmm. Barry Levinson did his first movie was Diner, I think. And then he did to Toys with Robin Williams, and mm -hmm. I haven't heard from Barry Levinson <coughs> in years, but but it was a, it was three of them: Jim Stahl, Barry Levinson, Craig T. Nelson. They were a comedy group. Steve Bluestein. Mm -hmm. Uh, myself, Bo Capral, um, Mulder, there weren't very many, Pat Croft. Yeah. Was, was Gallagher there yet? No. No, Gallagher came around. Gallagher 
actually, I, the first time I remember Gallagher being around was Comedy Store West. Mm -hmm. uh, he smashed a watermelon and Mitzi told him to do it again. <laughs> it was complete pandemonium, I guess. Yeah. Were, um, were you nervous the first time you went up? Well, yeah, of course, but I had I had written my act and memorized it. I didn't try anything out on anybody. I just went up there knowing that no matter how scared I was, I was going to be able to remember everything, and I did. And I got an encore, and I went back up, and I said, thank you so much for the encore. I have nothing else, but thank you. <laughs> Good night. But that was it, you know. I just, uh, I followed, I remember who I followed, Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo Band. Oh, I just interviewed the drummer. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, well, if it's the original drummer. Not the original, but, like, when they uh, became just Oingo Boingo. Right, right. And that was, uh, um, my, I have a friend that wrote for Danny Elfman, wrote all of the, most all of Danny Elfman's big scores for his movies. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all Edgardo Simone. Uh, one of my best friends, Steve Simone, that's his brother, Edgardo. And Edgardo wrote all those charts for those beautiful, you know, movies. Mm -hmm. What so, else you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> so by like 76, that was when um, Mitzi took over the place and uh, she built the uh, main room. Well, she had just the original room, and and then when she bought, let's see, uh, Art, Art LeBeau, it's weird. I was, for some reason, Art LeBeau liked, he took a liking to me, and he hired me to go come over and go on between, you know, Rosie and the Originals, some of those uh, doo-wop bands, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was like the only comic that he hired to come over there and and do comedy, in front, you know, in between the um, the doo wop groups, which was kind of I don't know why he or how he heard about me or whatever, but he, I, you know, it could have been because of my dad uh, was a singer and my and Art LeBeau probably knew who my dad was. Because, yes, uh, two days ago I was talking to Steve Bluestein and he said, oh, yeah, Denny, when you were when you first started out, you know, Sammy would go around and go, you know who that is on stage? That's Johnny Johnston's kid. <laughs> so <laughs> so Sammy must have said something to Art LeBeau. And that's why I got to go over there next door and work that room. Mm -hmm. And then you guys started getting... Uh guys who went on to become huge started coming in and performing there. Um, you know, of course, you had uh, Tom Dreesen and Jimmy Walker, and then you had guys like... Yeah, well, Walker, Walker was... I, Dreesen hadn't made it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Walker was the first comic in there that had a name. And uh, Leno and Letterman would write for... They, they wrote for him, because Jimmy had you know, happy days, and and uh, so he gave them a job as writers, and one of the best jokes, I don't know if Letterman wrote it or Leno wrote it or they wrote it together, but Jimmy Walker used to say, uh, <laughs> Ronald Reagan is, uh, he has said that, that he is going to uh, abolish the electric chair and install electric bleachers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and about a year and a half ago, I was in Vegas working with Jimmy, and I said, hey, you ought to, you ought to just update that joke now and, and say Donald Trump is going to abolish the electric chair and uh, put in electric bleachers. And he said, yeah. And so he did it, and it worked. So anyway. Wow. And, and then you guys, and then you had like Tim Thomerson and Billy Braver, oh, and um, uh, and who would you say? Billy Braver. You know, Billy Braver never made me laugh. Uh, he, just, 
I never got him. It's like yeah, there was Stanley Meyer and Handelman too. There was uh, that little guy with the glasses that he kind of thought he was like Woody Allen or something, and he just stopped. Stan, how do I remember that name? Stanley Myron Handelman. <laughs> anyway, he and Billy Braver, uh, yeah, those guys. You know, there's a there's some people that weren't very funny, but they were always around getting up on that stage. There was a guy, uh, actually a good-looking guy. He looked almost like a doctor. His name was, uh, uh, well, he called himself the, blue, the Balloon Man. His huh. first name was Bill. And he went up with this balloon jacket that he made out of pop balloons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like a jacket. And he'd go up and he'd blow, he'd tell jokes and blow up balloons and let them pop, you know. Try, they never even made balloon animals, you know, just strange. There wow. are a lot of strange people that went through there. Oh, yeah. I've heard all the stories, you know, uh, you know, uh, Mitzi wanted Jack Raymond to be Jackie Bananas. Oh, you know whose idea that was? That was my idea. Really? I told Mitzi, and Mitzi said, Jack, you gotta do Jackie Bananas. It's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, I said he should wear a yellow suit, yellow shirt, yellow tie, patent leather yellow shoes, yellow socks, and come up on stage with a violin. And never play the violin, never even just hold it like any young man. Yeah. <laughs> and just hold it and never say anything about it. And but just call himself Jackie Banana. And Mitzi just loved that idea and tried to get Jack to do it and he said, Nah, I don't want to do that. Because Jack used to he'd either kill or bomb. It was yeah. never in between, you know. Um it was one or the other. He would just uh, annihilate an audience or just piss them all off. <laughs> yeah, she liked uh, really, really strange acts come in there, you know, uh, like the unknown comic. Yeah. Well, that started with uh, Murray Langston. The two of us were, we had just written a screenplay. And we wrote a screenplay for, for Tim Thomerson and Robin Williams. Because those two guys were looking like they were really going to go somewhere, right? Right. So Murray and I wrote a, this was before Murray was the, the unknown comic. Uh, we wrote this script called Stand Up and Fall. And it was going to be about a stand-up comic that makes it real big and turns into an asshole. <laughs> and even betrays his best friend, who would have been Robin Williams. So we, could, we thought Thomerson was going to pop before Robin, you know, yeah. but, but we, uh, we wrote the script and then, so we wound up going over to, to do the gong show. We, uh, I went on, I won the gong show twice mm-hmm. and Murray went on and became the unknown comic. And so he would, he'd come back. Chuck Barris would have him back a lot. Even had him at, being a judge a couple of times, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I've been I've been trying to get Murray on the show the last three years that I've been uh, doing this and stuff, and we've been Facebook friends for like ten years. <laughs> yeah, I've talked to a lot of uh, men and women who were there then, and they told me there was just so much camaraderie and so much ener- good energy and support, but then it all faded away once the strike happened. No, it didn't. Not really. Uh, not really. No. After the strike, it was fun. I mean, there were. There was a few people who really suffered because, like Steve Lebetkin, couldn't get back yeah. in the lineup, and so he took a swan dive off the Hyatt House, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't remember camaraderie changing much at all. <laughs> we had fun during that strike. Mm-hmm. That strike was actually fun. I mean, every night we'd go out there, and Mitzi, I remember one night, Mitzi came in, she came in and into the driveway, into the parking lot, but before she crossed the driveway, <clears throat> excuse me, mm-hmm. she had to deal with comedians in the, on the sidewalk. So she politely honked her horn 
and Jeff, well, Jeff Altman and I were blocking her, you know, and she goes, get out of way. You know, and she was laughing. She, it wasn't, it wasn't all, oh, they, they made a comedy, didn't they make a, they just did a, what was that thing called? Uh, that series that was on HBO. Oh, the, uh, the Young Comedian special? No, it was called... Uh, on Location? Mine up here. Oh, that oh, was Showtime's show, yeah. Yeah, Jim Carrey produced it or something. I'm dying up here. Yes. Anyway, it was, that was supposed to be kind of like the comedy store. You know, Goldie was Mitzi. And Goldie was the owner of the comedy, of the, uh, the club, you know. Mm -hmm. I forget what they called the club, but... And, and things things kind of ran a parallel to what was happening at the comedy store. But the comedy store, we were never we never stabbed each other in the back and shit like they did on this series. Or you know, like mm -hmm. Leno used to say, you know, it's fun to watch someone on stage dying because you know it's fun to we all. With, it was kind of like if someone's having a bad set. It was kind of fun to to witness it. You don't really rub it in when they get off stage, but you know. Mm -hmm. But but everyone was. I remember it all being real friendly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard stories happen during the strike, like uh, Beth Maynard hit Jay Leno with a car while he was in camouflage. Like that. Oh God, who did tell me that? Uh, I can't remember. It's probably Tom Jerusalem or somebody. He came in what to the parking lot in the car, and Leno had camouflage pants on, so he no, he was he was dressed like a full fledged military commander or something like that, <laughs> and and um, Biff Maynard um, hit Jay Leno with the car because he just wanted to like you know make an example out of you know the whole the whole situation. Well, the something. strike. Yeah. That, that's a story I oh, heard. Yeah. You know, there weren't a lot of people that went across that, you know, like Lebetkin crossed it, Gary Shandling crossed the picket line. Mm -hmm. um, but Shandling, you know, he, he didn't need Mitzi anymore. You know, he got his own thing going. Right. Um, but, but we, you know, we stayed loyal. Most of us stayed loyal to Mitzi and, uh, but it's so weird because two, oh, maybe two weeks before the strike, I had called Meg Stahl. She was Mitzi's um, right-hand gal. Mm -hmm. She was married to Jim Stahl, yeah. who was a member of the, the, the graduates. Anyway, Meg was Mitzi's secretary, kind of, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just said, hey, Meg, could you talk to Mitzi about maybe getting comics to be able to get paid like I don't know 25 bucks for gas money uh, and, and see how that flies with her because um, everyone's coming down here and working and not getting paid anything and and uh, I don't know if she ever told Mitzi or Mitzi just said oh, you know the hell with them because she did have that attitude at the, but, but the strike happened Two weeks after I had mentioned that, and you know, if she had just given the message to Mitzi, and Mitzi had a had said, "Yeah, I'm going to start paying them," it would have never happened. Just it was it was just a long time for her to be making money uh, off of comics and not offering up anything, you know. Yeah. There was a lot, yeah, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on. And then after, you know, the strike, things got dark. And then you got um, Sam Kinison and, he, and Andrew Dice Clay come in there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Andrew Dice Clay, he's a strange guy. Um, yeah. I had a, I had a show, I got my own Showtime special. And I put, I put a, I put Bruce Baum in it and Vic Dunlop and Jeff Altman and mm -hmm. Joel Hodgson and uh, and Andrew Dice Clay. Really? Uh, he, he, he went, he, he was kind of a, he 
played uh, in, in my little special. He played like a chauffeur, mm -hmm. just a real nice guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then years later, he had already made it real big, and he was already coming down from stardom. And I asked him if he'd do a, a thing for me, and he goes, you know, I'm thinking he'd remember that. I put him in my special, you know. Yeah. And he goes, you know, well, why the what the why the fuck would I want to do that? You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, just uh, this attitude. I know that's terrible. What was the special called? My special was called. Uh, uh, it was. It was. Let's see. It was called. Uh, what was it called? Any chance to? Uh, Sell out. Sell out. It was called Sell Out. And the opening, they let me kind of have my own ideas and stuff. And so I, you know, I hired, I hired my friends to be in it and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then what the thing was is that that I had, I had now made it, or I thought that I had made it. You know, so in the beginning, you know, I pull up. We rented a, a limousine, a big white limo that had a hot tub in the back. Mm -hmm. It was so long. And I pull up and I get out and I have a tuxedo on and wrap around sunglasses and I'm smoking a cigarette in a cigarette holder. <laughs> and I'm walking toward the, the building with people around me and, and I had my br brother-in-law reach out with a pen and a pen had a paper say, and he said, Mr. Johnson, can, can I please have your autograph? And I, I just went, fuck off. <laughs> I pushed him <laughs> out of the way. You know, and I just, I was this asshole. And uh, I went in and then I had these girls giving me neck rubs and peeling grapes for me and everything. <laughs> and, uh, and then I had Jeff Altman. We rented him a uh, real loud, uh, jacket, you know, sports jacket that looked like Paisley. It was just like electric blue. And, <laughs> and uh, he came out as the MC, you know. Yeah. Uh, and he introduced me and I came out with the cigarette and the sunglasses and then the tuxedo. And I said, hey, how you doing? Hey, what about that Edie Amin? Do you remember the name Edie Amin? No. Oh, well, he was from Uganda, and he was killing his, he was killing his, his people. He was like, a, he was like a mass murderer dictator. Yeah. So I came out and I said, hey, what about that Idi Amin? He's a real mean guy. <laughs> and I had, to, we had told the audience, do not laugh at any of these jokes, right? So it just, it was just quiet. You could hear like, you know pin drop so I told uh, I told like three really corny jokes and and then I just turned and I ran off stage <laughs> and then Jeff Altman came out and he, he came out and he goes hey hey well uh, Denny's back there blowing chunks <laughs> and he goes oh wait he's back he's back and uh, then I came out in a Hawaiian shirt like I used to wear on stage all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I did my regular act, you know. I came out more humble. <laughs> and uh, it was a fun little Showtime special that never really did anything for me, but it was fun. Nice, nice. Did you get on The Tonight Show? One time. One time, I uh, what happened is they uh, they invited some comedians from the comedy store to come down and audition for Fred de Cordova mm -hmm. in front of an audience made up of um, this uh, a cross section of America. They would just pull people off of the NBC tour and pull them into and they pull them into this big auditorium and then we did our I remember Gallagher was there that day and anyway I did my act and um, and I, I remember doing really well and walking 
toward the back of the auditorium and Fred de Cordova, who was the, you know, the, the producer of the Tonight Show, he was sitting there along the sidelines. And as I walked past him, I, I put something in his hand and it was, it was rolled up fake money. It was play money. Mm-hmm. And it said, play money. I crossed out play and it said not negotiable. <laughs> I, put, I crossed out not. You know, just, and I, so I'm, it was like I was bribing him with play money. And it's just something I thought, oh, this is something Steve Martin would do, you know? Yeah. It's something stupid like that. And anyway, two days later, I got a phone call and it was Jim McCauley. And he said, uh, I don't know what you did, but uh, he, 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 you sure made Fred de Cordova laugh. He wants you on The Tonight Show. You ready? He, can you do it soon? And I said, sure. So I went over my act with him. You know, I, I, I went, I just told him exactly what I was going to do, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and it was going to be for like Thursday night or something. And I met, I just said, oh, I'm so excited. Uh, the Tonight Show, Johnny Carson. He goes, no, he won't be there. It's going to be John Davidson hosting. <laughs> oh, man. And I said, I said, Jim, um, I don't want to uh, offend you or anything, but is there any way I could just take a pass on this? And, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess it's always been my dream, you know, to do it with Johnny Carson. And he said, uh, he said, okay. And so I, I thought that was it. So then, I, I don't know, a couple of days later, he calls me again. He said, no, you're sp- you got to do it. You got to come in and do it. And I said, okay. And, and who's hosting? He says, he said, John Davidson. And I said, okay, uh, okay. So I went and I did it. Mm-hmm. And I was the second guest on. And John Davidson's first guest was Elliot Gould the actor. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Elliot Gould just did not, I guess John Davidson wasn't reading off his cheat sheet or something, but he it was a very awkward thing. And, and John Davidson finally got up and he came over and he sat on the edge of the desk and put the microphone in Elliot's face and said uh, then back to him and he said, well, we're going to we're going to take a, a quick commercial break here, right, Elliot? You know, yeah. Elliot Gould's just staring straight out at the audience, chewing gum. It was just very weird. So then I came on <laughs> right after that, after the commercial break. I come on and I got the, the reason I know this is because my brother in law, the same one that <laughs> when I did my special, I pushed away when he said, "Can I have your autograph?" <laughs> one of the frame. Fuck off, you know. Yeah. Anyway, Bobby Towers is his name. Anyway, Bobby uh, taped my my show, my set. Mm-hmm. This was back. This was in 1979, and hardly any of us had VCRs. Yeah. But Bobby had one, and he taped my set, so I was able to see my Tonight Show shot. Okay, and so I got, I got, I got uh, twenty-two laughs and seven applauses in my six minutes, and I called up Bobby Kelton to ask him if that was good. I, I said it's twenty-two laughs, and because Bobby Kelton had done uh, several Tonight shows, and I said is that good? Twenty-two laughs, seven applauses. He said, yeah, that's great. Who got that? I said, I did. And he said, oh, man, that's fantastic. Anyway, so when I called Jim McCauley, mm-hmm. I, I called him because I hadn't heard from him for a long time, and I I, I called him with some uh, a bit of confidence because I knew that 22 laps of self applauses was good. Anyway, I asked him, so what did you think, Jim? And he goes, uh, about what? I said, about my Tonight Show appearance. And he said, oh, I, I don't remember it. I said, well, you don't remember it? And he goes, oh, no, you know, that thing with Elliot Gould, that was a weird thing. It was just weird. And I said, well, um, I can send you a tape of it. So 
I did. I, I got my brother-in-law's tape instead of saying, well, go in the archives and look for yourself, you know. But I, I, anyway, maybe six months later, I get another phone call from Jim McCauley, and he goes, Denny, Jim McCauley, Tonight Show. Uh, can you do the Tonight Show uh, on the 13th of love you? And I said, uh, yeah, you know. And so we went over all the stuff, what I was going to do and everything, and then I just, I just, I said, and and who who's going to host? And he goes, John Davidson. And I said, <laughs> now you're kidding, right? And he says, okay, if you don't want to do it, fine. And he hung up on me. That was my Tonight Show career. Wow. That's, that's terrible that you had to go through that. But, hey, at least you got on there. I mean, that's most that's more than most people can say. Nice. I remember uh, you were on Chevy Chase and Friends. Right. Yeah, what, what, what was that like? How did you get selected? Well, I came home from Arizona, and I was, I remember I was very tired because I had been driving quite a long drive. And I got home, and there was a message on my answering machine. And I think it was, uh, it could have been uh, Bruce from the comedy store. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Uh, um, anyway, there was a guy that booked the, the comedy store. He was really a nice guy. I can't remember his name now. Uh, the, uh, not Mike Becker. No. No, way before. Way before. Uh, anyway. Robert Weil? No, way before. Oh, okay. This was 1970. This was 1979, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is for Chevy and Friends? Yeah. 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 It was all... Uh, the, the, the things that happened for me for television was all in 79, I think. It was The Tonight Show and then the 20 Make Me Laugh. Mm-hmm. And my Showtime special. And um, anyway, so I got a phone call on my machine. It says, Denny, come on down. The, uh, we want you to audition for a, for a show. So didn't tell me who it was or anything. And I was tired. I went down and got up and did my act. And I wasn't nervous because I was so tired, you know. Mm -hmm. And I get off stage and... I don't know if you know the the original room in, at the comedy store. Do, do you know I'm, much about that room? I'm very familiar with it. Yes. Um, okay, well, there was a little walkway that, if you walked out of, out of the back of the room mm -hmm. before you could go down those three steps, there was a little thing. If you turned right right away, it led you past where they put their towels and stuff like that, and then. Mm -hmm. It, you'd walk into the other side of the main room. I mean, they, not the main room, the original room, and by the ticket booth there and stuff. And it, anyway, it was a little breezeway, a little walkway there. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and anyway, I, I get off stage and I I go there, and out out from that walkway, this Chevy Chase pops out. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, Danny, uh, Chevy Chase. And I went, oh, hi. And he goes, hi. Uh, oh, would you would you like to do to to do my special with me? And I said, <laughs> of course. And uh, that's how I got the I got the. He saw me do my act, and 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 he t later told me when you did started that song, mm -hmm. that real pretty song, and then it turned into I'm an asshole. Yeah. He goes, that's when I decided I wanted to right away. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Chevy picked me 
the first. And uh, and that was that was kind of neat, you know. That was, yeah. You did that hilarious impression of Jack Nicholson with the pig nose mask, and you were like, "Okay, you little turd droppers." <laughs> oh, that was yeah, that beard, yeah. That, it was a clown. It was a clown mask with the you know, a little bulb, bulbous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know, I look at I looked at that not too long ago, and I went, "Oh, my Nicholson was so bad back then." You know, it was so. I don't know. I just. I didn't even know how to do them, but I did Jack Nicholson as a kitty show host, yeah. Yeah, you, you do a perfect John Wayne. And I did Rick Nelson selling Hamburger Helper. <laughs> oh, yeah. you. I, first, I remember the first time I saw you was on Red Fox's Dirty, Dirty Jokes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what was he, what was he like? Uh, you know what? I didn't even meet him that night. I don't even think I'm even got to say hello to him. He was like with his entourage. Oh. Um, I remember Bob Fisher from the Ice House had something to do with setting up all those people. Mm-hmm. And Bob Fisher took me aside before I went on. He said, remember I told you not to be dirty. I tell you not to do anything dirty tonight. I want you to be as dirty as you can. <laughs> and I, I think I wasn't even very dirty. I, Andrew Dice Clay was on that night too. Yeah, he did 13 minutes, I remember, and he he, he, he had everything there, but he, he was lacking confidence. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, dirty, dirty jokes. And, God. Uh, and the great Robert Schimmel. Oh, I loved Robert Schimmel. He was brilliant. Oh, man, he was he was brilliant. That guy could take anything and, and make it dirty. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> he yeah. was brilliant. His story about when he went scuba diving, Mm-hmm. And they talked about if a shark approaches you, just hit him on the nose. Yeah. Smack him on the nose, you know. And, and he said, you know, I, sharks are probably just, you know, they probably go, what the fuck was that for? You know what? He goes, I was going to swim right past you, but you had to do that. You had to knock me on the nose. Now I'm going to chew the shit out of you. <laughs> yeah, I used to love that. Yeah, uh, my favorite, my favorite that I always quote from from Schimmel is, you know, he doesn't want to do phone sex because he's afraid the call is going to go like this. Okay, you got your dick out. Yeah, you're jerking off. Yeah, your mother wants to talk to you. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, he's so he was so funny. Yeah. Yeah. He he just could. I don't know. He just he was a very funny man. Did you did you get a development deal for your own sitcom? Never did. Never did. No, no. How about no. how about for movies? No, no. There was a guy. There was a there was a a book, an author that wanted. There was a. I was it Hunter S. Thompson, who wrote The Woodpecker or something. There was a a book out about this. I have no idea. Mad Bomber. And this guy was like, I think it was Hunter S. Thompson. Sounds like something Kurt Vonnegut would write. No, it wasn't him. It was Hunter S. Thompson. And he saw me or something up in Seattle and wanted to use me in a, in a movie if they made this movie. And they, I don't think they ever made it. But anyway. No career in that, and I I retired. I don't. I'm not doing stand up now. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, did I? Well, do you remember the story? Are you? It's it's not a story. It's it's on YouTube. If you if you YouTube, um, comedian hits heckler with guitar. Mm-hmm. Is, there's some there's uh, some footage of a guy, I think his name was Kenny Moore, and he was playing Oklahoma. And he, he he's up there tuning his guitar, kind of, you know, mm. just kind of chit-chatting mm. with the audience. And, uh, and the camera's just still, it's a static shot from the club camera. There's no movement or anything, no zooming in. That's just a still shot of him from the waist up, right? Mm-hmm. And he's got this 12-string guitar, and he's, 
and he's dealing with these loud uh, people in the audience. And finally, he looks over at this table and he goes, he goes, hey, man. He says, come on, man. I don't come down to the bus station and slap the cock out of your mouth when you're working. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, he goes, yeah, well, come on, motherfucker. And he takes the guitar off and swings it out of the frame, and you hear this big thud. And, and now you hear the audience go, oh, man. That was uncalled for, you know, and he, mm -hmm. and he brings the guitar back into the frame and the whole back of the guitar is gone. Oh, man. I thought, I thought you were going to say that was you. <laughs> no, it's not me. No, he broke the guitar over the guy's head, you know? Yeah. And so, so I watched that and then I watched about five more. I just typed in comedian versus heckler and I started watching, you know, different comics being heckled. Yeah. And uh, after I watched about five, six comics being heckled, I just, I, I got off uh, YouTube and I got on Facebook and I typed, I typed this. Um, in the 47 years I did stand up comedy, I was heckled approximately four times. Enough is enough. I quit. <laughs> That was my that was my notice of uh, retirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know I was so lucky. I was just so lucky. I did. I, I guess it's because people wanted to see what's going to come out of that prop suitcase next, you know, and yeah. spoil it or you know something. <laughs> and then you know, and then I did characters. I was I was always you know. I, I was basically saying, look at this, look at this, not me, don't look at me, don't listen to me, listen to my, this impression, listen to this goofy song, you know, that's just the way I was, I I don't know how people get up and just with going up there with nothing but their voice, and just, hello, how are you, you know, and starting and being funny without a, a guitar or a props, I you know, I admit it. I I hid behind all that stuff, but yeah, I also looked like I was having a good time, which I was. You know. Yeah. Do you have any regrets? No, I I have no regrets. Um, maybe maybe I should have said uh, yes to Jim McCauley when he asked me to do the Tonight Show with John Davidson again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and here's another regret I have. Um, mm -hmm. I got off stage one night. At the, I had a real good set. I get off stage. And this, somebody taps me on the shoulder. I turn around, and it, it looked like Donovan, but it was Jay Leno. He had these little <laughs> round glasses. Yeah. And I, I don't even remember Leno wearing glasses to set that one night, you know? Mm-hmm. I remember he looked like Don. He reminded me of Donovan, you know. And he goes, "Hey, I just, uh, I, I just, I just, I just saw your act, and uh, I just wanted to tell you you're real good." And I, and I was talking to, I was wanted to talk to Johnny Dark and Kipadada, you know. Yeah. So I said, "Oh well, yeah, hey, thanks." And I turn and I start talking to Kip and Johnny Dark. Well, about an hour later, Leno gets on stage. I, he had just come out from Boston. I had never seen him. He gets up and he does uh, Elvis the Bus Boy and all this stuff. He had this great act. And he got off stage. And uh, so I found him later in the club and I tapped him on the shoulder. And he turned around and I said, Hey, I just wanted to tell you, I just saw you, man. And you are very, very, very funny. And he goes, Oh, yeah, well, thanks. And he turns around, he turns his back to me. And starts talking to the people he was talking to. He busted my balls, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I just said, I tapped him on the shoulder. He turned around. I said, touche. I said, you know what? You've taught me a lesson. I'll never do that to anybody again in my life. And, he, and, and we were friends, you know. I used yeah. to go up and play videos at his house. And I went on, I went motorcycle riding with him on the, the Jay Leno love ride that he used to do out of Burbank. Mm -hmm. 
And, and you know, if if I call Leno, he'll he'll return my call the same day, which is nice. You know, we're mm-hmm. we've always been friends, but not enough not enough to put me on his show when he had his show. He all of us, none of us. I mean, he put a few people on, put Carrot Top on, <laughs> and uh, he put Grease on a few times, and but so many of us were just. Uh, but I never, I never let it bother me that much. Uh, if, the, if he, that was one of his weird things. He just didn't want. Yeah, let, comics. Yeah. Yeah, Letterman. I mean, he put you know uh, Tom on and um, and Tim Thomerson and George Miller and and Gary Muldeer on. You know, all the way up until you know he retired. And Spoon Witherspoon. And John Witherspoon. Yeah. Yeah, you... I got to do one Letterman too, and uh, you know, I, I don't know if you ever remember, Bob, but I used to, I used to purposely make sure the guitar mic was on my left side, mm-hmm. down low, and when I'd come, the first time I, I'd, I'd use the guitar mic, it was I would talk and I'd bend over and I'd say, "Here's a song," I, and I'd put the sound hole. To the vocal mic, you know, it's yeah. just very Steve Martinish, stupid, you know. Right. And I bend, yeah, I bend over, and I—that's how I used to open my act so many times. I would just, I bend over and say, uh, "Here's the song I wrote when I was in that guitar." Yeah, I'd strum it, you know, right? I'd strum the guitar. Mm-hmm. into the vocal mic and I talk into the guitar mic anyway so that was all set up to do on Letterman what and, huh oh no no go ahead but yeah on the Letterman on the on the late night with David Letterman and when I went to do it as we were on air you know the fucking mic wasn't on oh. so when I spoke into that mic it they didn't even hear me. It just looked like I didn't know what I was doing, you know? Yeah. Oh, God. And, um... What, what do you think of today's comedy? Well, there's some people I love. Bill Burr. Oh, he's the best. He is, listen to this. Oh, uh, Mitzi, you know, when Mitzi passed away, they had a, they had a memorial, they had a, a special memorial for her at the comedy store. And uh, they went all out. They bought, they they had food out in the parking lot. They covered the whole parking lot with like a, a, a black velvet carpeting. It was really nice. And then they had heaters and lights and, you know, and all this food and everything, you know. And, yeah. and people went on and did their you know, the tribute to, to Mitzi and stuff like that in the main room and in the uh, original room. But when I first got there, I walked in. Again, if, if you know the layout of the comedy store, the main room, there was a, uh, there's a walk, there's a, a kind of a backstage there. There's, you walk, you can walk, right off the street into a door and then it goes along the back of the uh, dressing rooms there and then mitzi had put in a little bar back in there anyway i went in as soon as i got in there i saw louis anderson and i start talking to louis and uh i look up uh, about five minutes and into it and there's bill burr and I just stood up and I went, oh, my God, Bill Burr. I said, oh, man, I, I am a huge fan. I listen to you on Spotify all the time. You just really make me laugh. And he goes, oh, thank you. And he, and I said, and I reached out to shake his hand. I said, I'm, he goes, what's your name? And I said, Denny Johnston. And he goes, holy shit. I go, what? He goes, you're the guy that used to run the skill saw across your face. Yeah. <laughs> And he goes, that was one of my favorite comedy bits of all time. And I went, oh, thank you. And so five minutes after I got to the comedy 
star. Bill Burr said that to me. You can imagine, I was on cloud nine the rest of the night, man. Mm -hmm. I can yeah. imagine. Yeah, he's one of the best. Yeah, I just think yeah. I just think there's not enough jokes these days. It's all story uh, oriented. Well, I, I think Jim Gaffigan's amazing. The amount yeah. of uh, comedy he's written, the amount of material that he has written. I think Louis C.K. was very, very good too. Uh, he got a little weird a lot. Well, he got weird a lot. Yeah, <laughs> he got weird a lot. But he also did some brilliantly funny things. Um, yeah. Did you ever hear the thing about him flipping the silver dollar? And, yeah. No, I never heard that story. <laughs> oh, well, he, he just said that no, over in England. He says they give you these big coins and you feel like a cowboy walking into a saloon and slapping that thing down and saying, yeah, give me a, <laughs> give me a, a jug of whiskey and a steak and uh feed my horses and all this all this for all that one coin you know yeah. a haircut a shave and a room for three nights and it's just he bangs that that coin down once and makes all his demands for that one one fucking coin you know <laughs> and it's just it's just amazing how he he plays different people his voices were great mm -hmm. see they well, well, Denny, well, Denny, this has been a lot of fun talking about the classic years of comedy. And, you know, I, I talked to Gloria Vassi last summer, and she told me that uh, you would be great to talk to, and I totally agree with her. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And you ever talked to Mule Deer, Gary Mule Deer? Uh, I think I reached out to him, but I don't think I heard back, no. He's, he's a great guy. Uh, well, anyway, send me that. Uh, info and I'll send you that other info. Yes, absolutely. And stay safe during this crazy time. You know, yeah. um, I'm hoping it's going to be over pretty soon, uh, sooner than they they tell us. You know, and, and it may, it may be. So, okay, my friend. Thank you for calling me, and thanks for uh, considering me. And uh, if uh, if you ever want to call again, call me. Absolutely, that would be awesome. You have yourself a great uh, night. Well, it's almost night time. <laughs> have a great night over there. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Denny Johnston, ain't he a cool dude? Man, love those old comedy store stories. They are just awesome. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.